Welcome to AUSA's Army Matters Podcast, focusing on what's important to the total Army community. We bring vital Army conversations and interviews on issues relevant to soldiers, military families, and all of you amazing Army supporters. Rotating each week, our show includes Soldier Today, Army Real Talk, Family Voices, and Thought Leaders. Let's tune into the show. Hello, everyone. I'm Colonel Retired Scott Halstead, and welcome to the inaugural edition of the Leading Great Teams podcast. The Leading Great Teams podcast is brought to you by the Center of Leadership at the Association of the United States Army. This monthly podcast series will focus on themes relevant to the regular Army, the Army National Guard, and the Army Reserve to include building trust through transformational leadership, moral character and leaders, stewardship of the Army profession, leader in organizational resilience, and unit culture. Our guests today are the command team from the 173rd Airborne Brigade, Colonel Mike Klepper and Commander Christopher Clappen. Colonel Klepper is a 1997 graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point, a 2015 graduate of the Keenan Flagler School of Business at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and a 2021 distinguished graduate of the United States Army War College. He served as a platoon leader, company commander, battalion commander, and deputy regimental commander in the 75th Ranger Regiment. He also served as a company commander and battalion commander in the 2nd Battalion, 503rd Parachute Infantry Regiment. His foreign of staff assignments include serving as the operations officer of the 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment in the 82nd Airborne Division, and as the future operations officer and executive officer of the 1st Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta. Commander Sergeant Clappen entered active duty on the 7th of January, 1998. His first duty assignment was with Alpha Company, 3rd Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment, where he served in every duty position from rifleman through rifle platoon sergeant. Command Sergeant Clappen served as the first sergeant for both Charlie Company and Headquarters and Headquarters Company in the 1st Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment. His most recent assignments include Operations Sergeant Major of the 75th Ranger Regimental Special Troops Battalion, Command Sergeant Major for the 75th Ranger Regimental Military Intelligence Battalion, and Command Sergeant Major for the 3rd Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment. Command Sergeant Clappen is a graduate of the United States Special Operations Command Joint Special Operations Forces Senior Enlisted Academy and the U.S. Army Sergeant Majors course. He's earned a bachelor's degree in history from Eastern Washington University. Colonel Klepper and Commander Clappen have each deployed multiple times to Afghanistan and Iraq. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking time to join us. More importantly, thank you for your exceptional and selfless service to Rangers, paratroopers, the Army, and the nation. So the theme of this podcast is all about leadership. And so you are the inaugural guest based upon your professional reputation and what you've done in the Army up to this point. And so, Colonel Klepper, let's start with you. Can you describe some of the most important leader development events that you experienced as a junior officer in either the 70th Ranger Regiment or the 173rd Airborne Brigade? In sort of reflecting and thinking about preparing for this interview, I'm not completely sure that I'm qualified to be interviewed, to be completely honest with you. You know, like if you could look under our skirt, if you could pick up the hood of the 173rd Airborne Brigade, we've got plenty of blemishes. We've got plenty of tension within our teams that we're working through. We've got plenty of issues, qualitative and quantitative, that are not great. So anything that we have to share, at least anything I have to share, is by virtue of a mistake that I've made and a leader that has shown me mercy and grace when I needed it. So anything I share is in that context. So I'll start with that. In terms of important sort of formative leader experiences, leader developmental events as a junior officer. I think the model that I paint and what I would describe is every significant leadership decision I've made as a field grade or as a battalion commander, or at least thus far in brigade command, my reference point for that decision most commonly is my platoon leader experience. And so I highlight that because And that shouldn't be a surprise. It's obviously not a surprise to any of your listeners. Platoon leaders are most relatively inexperienced leaders, so they have the most to learn, and they're closest to the soldiers, immersed and surrounded by folks who are charged with mentoring them. So the model sort of works that you continue to learn, but you do your most learning up front. So it's through that model that I think the question gains traction. And I think if I were to pick an event we used to do these old Idris called Savage Strike. <laughs> Clearly, that's the Sergeant Major's formative experience yeah. as well. Yeah. But, you know, not a super creative, you know, event, very imaginable to you and all of the listeners. And you'd be alerted and go through an 18 hour sequence and jump out of an airplane into a drop zone that you hadn't seen before and assemble. And then, you know, you'd walk for three days to some objective. 
And that is a mechanism to build toughness and to bring a team together and to build humility and to lead through adversity. Those types of experiences as a young officer absolutely informed the next 20 years. For me, it was the Savage Strike Idri models. But the second one, and maybe not exactly what you asked, as a group or, you know, maybe more mundane or more routine, the squad leaders that I had in my second platoon, so second platoon Alpha Company 275, those four squad leaders and that platoon sergeant, by far those five human beings were the most formative on my development as an officer. But because they had the tactical and technical expertise, and they were genuinely interested in making me a good lieutenant and subsequently a reasonably okay captain. And so I think that we had these significant events like Savage Strike, but more so it was just the constant tutelage and mentorship of my NCOs at the time. So Colonel Klepper, first of all, I've known you a long time. And so I appreciate your professional humility. Of course, you're going to make mistakes, learn and grow and build a team with your Ranger buddy that reflects that culture. But I really appreciate your comments. And we don't talk about this enough. The fact that if you show me a good platoon leader or company commander, they're going to be surrounded by great non-commissioned officers. They just don't grow on their own. And I appreciate your perspective of those five Ranger non-commissioned officers. You know, I'm sure you think about them all the time to this day, as you've now experienced almost 25 years in the Army and greater authorities, greater responsibilities, and bigger challenges. You can look back to those early days in 2nd Platoon Alpha Company, 2nd Ranger County and go, you can hear the voices of those non-commissioned officers still in your head. Facebook's amazing. They're all out there <laughs> jousting at me, telling me what I'm screwing up. <laughs> still coaching you. Commander Clappin, you grew up in Alpha Company, 3rd Ranger Battalion. Same question. What are some of the most developmental experiences that you went through as a young ranger and a young non-commissioned officer? So, Commander, stole a little bit of my thunder, but we have similar experiences and backgrounds. You know, I grew up in the Ranger Regiment in the late 1990s. A guy you may have heard of called Colonel Stanley McChrystal was the RCO. And so as I look back at like my formative years, right, in the first sort of two, three years in the Army, they were spent doing very difficult things. And when I go back and I reference that period of time, I use that to reference the totality of my Army career, those first two to three years, because I honestly believe, you know, that's where I built who I am as a leader today. Colonel Klepper mentioned that the Savage Strikes. We used to call them the walk and walks. You know, you'd alert, marshal, deploy, get on a plane or get on a helicopter and go somewhere and then walk, you know, for two or three days straight. Through that experience, I honestly believe I am who I am today as a leader because of those experiences. The Army talks a lot about building tough, resilient soldiers and paratroopers or rangers, whatever you want to call it. And we look through that through, I think, a very similar lens because of those shared experiences not in the same battalion, but in the same organization in the same period of time. You know, I truly believe that the way you influence resiliency and the way you influence toughness is through the long range training calendar and being very programmatic in the activities you're doing. You know, that's the easiest way, I think, as an organizational leader. I appreciate your perspective on that time in Alpha Company 2nd Ranger Battalion, Alpha Company 3rd Ranger Battalion, that really shaped the way you look at how you build and lead cohesive and lethal teams today. So Colonel Klepper, who had a significant impact on your development as a junior officer and why? So I think in thin slicing the questions apart, leadership experiences and sort of leadership development advice, if I were to like thin slice or cleave components of officership out of that, I think in the Army's onto this, this is not new or unknown information. The impact that a battalion commander has on lieutenants is significant. When I counsel our company commanders, a large part of the counseling comes from Lieutenant Colonel Jim Harris, my first battalion commander. A large part of the counseling comes from Lieutenant Colonel Mike Okita, my first Ranger battalion commander. A large part of the counseling comes from Lieutenant Colonel Kevin Owens, my second Ranger battalion commander. That's more than 20 years ago that I can clearly remember the expectations laid out by those who are to me, I mean, they're senior leaders now, but who are to me, these enduring lieutenant colonels who taught me how to be a young officer. Now, Major General Chris Donahue, his impact on me when he was a company commander and I was a platoon leader, in terms of learning how a company commander can manage a training process and influence the environment around them, 
pretty significant and informed both my captain and field grade years. I'll share one quick story about one other leader and then close off. So probably 2007, this isn't a junior officer story, but maybe like mid-grade captain story, 2007 as a ranger company commander. For company commander in 2007, the Army was a pretty miserable place. And I think if you look back in time, the retention numbers show that. And a lot of back-to-back deployments and casualties and ambiguous circumstances and just all these things are bad. And at that moment in time, my third son was born at Fort Stewart and we were looking down the barrel of our next deployment and I was considering very heavily getting out of the Army. I did not want to be in the Army anymore. And about a week after Samuel was born, we got a card in the mail from then Colonel Clark, the Ranger Regimental Commander. And it was a handwritten card just congratulating my wife and I. Man, I can't even talk about it without crying. Congratulating my wife and I on the birth of our third son. But what makes the story is that the card was postmarked from Ramstein Air Base. So the Ranger Regimental Commander, on his like 90-minute break between airplanes while he was deploying, walked up to the PX and bought this crummy little card, hand wrote it, and threw it in the mail to my wife and I. So I'm sold. Army for life. If I've got a leader like that, I'm here to stay. So Colonel Klepper, I'm smiling because I know many of the great leaders you just mentioned. Kevin Owens is a hero of mine. He's the only person in the Army. I was on the phone with him. He chewed my butt so bad I stood at attention on the other end of the phone while he uh, provided some guidance that I was long overdue. Yeah, if you ask me my personal heroes, now General Rich Clark was my Ranger Company commander, and I tried to execute training, and I tried to build the team the way he did throughout the rest of my career. So I appreciate your perspective there. Commissioner Clapman, same thing to you. Who had a significant impact on your development as a Ranger non-commissioned officer and why? So it's tough. I was fortunate enough to grow up in organizations where, you know, truly it's an embarrassment of riches in terms of leaders and just the people that you serve with. So it's a tough question to answer. And I think it's actually been different people during different periods of time, right? So I've been an NCO now for about 22 years. And I would say early on, As a very young NCO, and he probably has no idea that I'm going to say this, but it's a guy named Mike Hall. You know, we talked about General McChrystal. He was actually General McChrystal's regimental SAR major in the late 90s, and he was also the CSM that used to talk in a few other places as well. Very early on as an NCO, I would probably say him. He's a guy who took NCO professional development really seriously. He developed probably one of the first team leader courses in the Army, going back to like whenever I went to it, I think it was 1999. And he was the first guy that I kind of saw that transcended historical or sort of normative NCO duties and responsibilities and really kind of transcended all that and added real value to the command in terms of training, organizational leadership, leadership development, all the tactical stuff to He was a guy that's like, man, if I could be half as good as that guy someday, I'm doing pretty good. So, Star Mayor, here's what's interesting. Just to go back to Colonel Klepper's point about the five non-commissioned officers in his platoon that raised him. I've got a good friend. He spent about 30 years in the Army, retired as a colonel. And if I asked him who's the most important person that developed him over the years, he would say, first Sergeant Mike Hall from Alpha Company, 1st Range Battalion. So you all have worked for Pantheon of incredible leaders and are continuing to build upon their legacy and what they're doing right now. We'll be right back after this message from the Association of the United States Army. Have you purchased your AUSA swag yet? Be proud to show your support for AUSA, which in turn shows your support for the U.S. Army and our soldiers. Check out all AUSA swag at shop.ausa.org. So let's transition and talk a bit more about what you're doing as the brigade commander and the brigade command star major of the 173rd. So for our listeners, the 173rd Airborne Brigade is the U.S. Army's contingency response force in Europe, and they provide rapid forces to the United States European, African, and Central Command's area responsibilities. They got a total of six battalions, and they're four deployed both in Italy and Germany, and the brigade routinely trains alongside their NATO allies and partners to build interoperability and strengthen the alliance. So for both of you, as the brigade command team, what are the brigade leader development programs that you've instituted over the past year, and who's your audience for these programs? 
I think we agree the squad leaders are our cultural decisive point. So we're all in on culture. And if you were to look at the drivers of culture in the brigade combat team, it's our staff sergeants, it's our squad leaders in the barracks. And so, at least from my lens, the way to get to the squad leaders is through the company battery and troop commanders. It's a natural hinge point. I'm two levels up from them. They're two levels up from the squad leaders. And the company commanders at that hinge point, if we're picking them right and educating them right and training them right, they should, over time, have the ability to translate vision and ideas and policy and local unit SOPs into action, into things that can be done and supervised and inspected at the company level. So while we view squad leaders as our decisive rank, our point of entry to influence that rank, our point of entry to influence the culture of the brigade is through our company battery troop commanders and first sergeants. From an officer's perspective, my aspiration for that level of leader is not that our company commanders be great here, that's fine, but I would want each of them to leave here and be the best field grade in their next brigade. If you look at it through that lens of your time here in total should be a leader development experience that equips you to be the best S3 or XO in whatever your career field is in your next brigade. And whoever your next brigade commander is should say, where did you come from, the 173rd? We love that because we know you're going to knock it out of the park. So we're trying to take a little bit longer term perspective. And then in terms of implementation, what we've done and what we're working through is to take the totality of our long range training calendar out as far as we can see it and to weave our leader development events and experiences through the calendar in a way that complements the collective training events. You know, I could use FM70 language and the eight step training model to describe leader validation, but in a way that is hopefully more inspiring to the intended audience than just the doctrine would suggest. An example, probably the high watermark example that we'll try to replicate in the future. So, before our last CTC rotation, we had for the company commanders an event called the Leader Valex, and it was literally a leader validation exercise of what we wanted the brigade to be able to do. So we conducted the metal crosswalk of the training exercise, all of the things that we wanted the soldiers to be able to do under offensive operations, all the things we wanted the soldiers to be able to do under defensive operations, et cetera, et cetera. And then we, in the JMRC training area, we laid out the operational graphics of a brigade defensive framework, and the company commanders formed a platoon, and in a Mungadai-like event, we walked through a brigade defensive framework, starting in the rear echelon. So in the rear echelon, almost like Camp Buckner, in the rear echelon, the company commanders had to learn about and then in place a howitzer, and then walk five kilometers, learn about vehicle maintenance, conduct PMCS in a field environment, change a tire in a field environment, conduct vehicle recovery, sort of in like this little mini CrossFit exercise, put your army stuff back on, keep walking. And then in the next place, here's 300 meters of wire in place, 300 meters of, you know, triple stand concertina wire two standard, big fighting positions two standard, which took all night and was miserable. Conduct patrol based activities two standard. So we distilled down the collective training events to the hardest things that our soldiers would have to do. And we validated that our leaders could do it and that our leaders could lead them through doing it. So I saw and participated and dug with the company commanders. So there should be no misunderstanding. When we say establish a defense, we mean 18 inches of overhead cover. I know you can do it because I saw you do it. I know you can place the wire because I saw you in place the wire. We place the wire together. So that was a pretty good lead in. At least I thought it was pretty good. I don't know what the company commanders thought. <laughs> they thought it was like the JMRC version of Ranger School, but that was blending experiential learning and grit and toughness and sort of doctrinal training management into a pretty good event, aimed ultimately at turn steering the culture through our squad leaders. So this validation exercise, you use peer evaluations. If you had a company battery troop commander that fell short, how did you and the battalion or squadron commander sort of redirect and help that captain reach his or her full potential prior to doing this sort of thing in front of their paratroopers? 
Right. So there's two secret components to it that sort of made it go pretty well. Each of the parts of the battle space, for lack of a better word, you know, like the rear echelon area and the main battle area and the reconnaissance zone, each of those components had an O5 in charge of it, a battalion. So the artillery battalion commander was in charge of the artillery site, and my sustainment battalion commander, Tony Newman, was in charge of teaching and evaluating sustainment, and the infantry battalion commanders were in charge of the main battle area. And so because each chunk of this had a lieutenant colonel in charge of it, it gets an awful lot of concentrated attention that makes things go well. We did use peer evaluations as a mechanism for counseling and feedback on the tail end. Generally, everybody did pretty well, but it was illuminating. Not everybody did great, you know. And so if nothing else, it was a reasonable opportunity to provide objective feedback, you know, to folks who are still developing. So, Major, how about you? What are some of the brigade level leader development programs that are important to you and your non-commissioned officers? So I guess just real quick, a couple points on how we look at leader development holistically in, in the brigade. So I guess I'll start off by saying we sort of believe that the success or failure of the army of, of the brigade in the next big land war probably depends on small unit leaders. So as we look at leader development holistically in the brigade, that's the lens that we look at it through. And for that reason, the company is sort of the center of gravity in the 173rd. So everything that we do is framed that way. And I'll use the most recent CTC rotation that we did in JMRC, Bayonet Ready. That's where the commander did the Mungadai type event that he executed with the company commanders. We sort of reframed that exercise to focus at the company level. And it really allowed us to do some of the activities that the commander just described. It really helped us look at you know, what are the actual capabilities of the brigade at the company level where it really matters? And so on the NCO side of the house, my focus is obviously on the company first sergeant demographic. It's much the same. You know, at my level, we're not necessarily talking about how to write NCOERs and things of that nature at that level. It's much more philosophical. So some of the things that I focus on are critical thinking, ethical decision making, the profession of arms, you know, what does it mean to be a true professional and how does that kind of guide our moral compass and just how we do things every day, things of that nature. So it is very much focused on growing leaders for the future, for the next big war, right? The leaders that are going to be in senior level leadership positions, battalion and brigade and the next war. So I just thought it was important to frame how we look at leadership development with the company being the center of gravity here in the 173rd. Because your brigade is spread between Vicenza and Germany, I would assume that is more challenging to achieve your objectives, but maybe not. How do you make sure that your focus on company commanders and first sergeants that are next to you in Vicenza, you have the same focus with your elements in Germany? It is tough. You know, and I don't think that's necessarily unique to the 173rd. I think there's plenty of brigade level organizations in the Army that are kind of experiencing those same challenges. But a lot of the time, it's a few different ways. For me personally, I do that a few different ways. At events where we do have the entire brigade in one location, you kind of got to make good use of your time. You got to use that as an opportunity to, to do some of those activities that you wouldn't normally be able to do. So that's one way we do it. Those opportunities, I will say, are few and far between. So what it usually involves is, you know, I kind of have to do things more than once. I'll do things with the audience. You know, we call it South of the Alps, the four battalions down here. I'll do something with them. And then oftentimes I'll try and replicate the exact same event when I go north of the Alps up into Germany. And then, you know, there's the virtual means. It's 2022. We do a lot of virtual things, not only because of the pandemic, but because of the geographical separation that we have in the brigade. It's got to help that both of you grew up in the range regiment that is geographically dispersed and saw firsthand how to do that or multiple ways to do that. And now that you're a brigade command team, you get to put into practice. Just one last note on that, you know, while we're still on that topic, it is actually trying to implement what the Army calls mission command, you know, and it's about trusting your subordinate leaders and sort of providing that mentorship as much as you can, but really trusting them to make good decisions. You know, hey, here's my advice to you. I trust you to make the right decision. If it doesn't work out or if you need additional help, let me know and I'll go more in depth where I'm needed. But it's actually trying to inculcate the mission command doctrine throughout the entire formation. 
So, Sergeant Major, can you give an example without using names of where you expected a subordinate to exercise discipline initiative, but maybe they didn't, and how you responded to that? So, I would just say from a from a brigade CSM perspective, I think a lot of times we take that mission command model and we apply it to the operational realm, and we actually have quite a bit of success with it because I think people, especially at the O5 level, commander CSM level, I think you know they're pretty good generally at taking commander's intent, figuring out the details and how they can kind of implement that intent and be super successful with it. I think we're pretty good in the operational domain. Where we maybe, and I think this is an Army thing, I don't think this is a 173rd thing, but I think where we could be a little bit better with mission command is at the small unit level, just your basic standards and discipline stuff. You know, hey, in the absence of being told to do something, take the initiative to go ahead and, you know, basic stuff. Let me go ahead and clean up my area or let's do a walk through the barracks. Let's do uniform inspections. All the really basic army things that certainly I grew up with and I still do those things personally, you know, PCIs, all those good things. I think maybe that's something as an army we could probably do a little bit better. Okay. So we've talked mostly about how you all grew up in the Army, your experiences, both as members of great teams and leading great teams. Let's transition now to how you develop yourself. So, Sergeant Major, you've been in the Army, you just passed 25 years. What do you do to develop yourself to make sure that you can take all these great lessons you learned growing up, but you can build upon them as you build and lead your current team? How do you develop yourself? No, I appreciate the question. I just hit 24 years, not 25. I'm not that old, but I just hit 24 years in the Army. So. You know, I'll look at it a few different ways. So on a personal level, in terms of how do I keep myself in the right mindset? How do I keep myself humble? How do I put myself in a mental space where I'm still able to kind of relate to young soldiers and set the right example and all those good things? I mean, I still have my daily routine that I do that is the same as like 20, however many years ago. And I try and do that to keep myself in that same mindset, you know, to keep myself disciplined because the higher up you go, the fewer people are sort of holding you accountable, right? I mean, it's just true. So when we talk about a culture of accountability in the brigade, you know, I try to lead by example in that regard. And I do it by doing things the same way I did 24 years ago. Like rigging your rucksack the day before. Like rigging my rucksack. You know, PCI is, I PCI the colonel or whatever, you know, he PCI's me. It's you absolutely know, we, true. We, we try and, and he rigs his rucksack the night before a jump. Right. So like all these good things that you were taught by your first team leader in squad leader, right? I, I still try and do those things. So that's at a personal level. On a more professional level, what do I do to develop myself as a leader? I try to read things that will help me be a balanced leader, that will help me kind of view things as objectively as possible. Because after being in the Army for 24 years, you start to become pretty set in your ways. So, you know, if it's the news, I don't take my news from a single source. I try and read a wide variety of things. It'll give me a wide sort of broad opinion or viewpoint. But yeah, it's mostly reading. I try and improve my mind so that I can be that sort of voice of reason for the command. So a book I've been reading kind of off and on recently is called The Hunter-Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century, Evolution and the Challenges of Modern Life. It's written by a pair of evolutionary biologists, and they kind of tell the human story and then use that framework of evolution to challenge some of the paradigms that we've kind of accepted in modern life. It's a pretty refreshing book to read because it's very objective. There's no political slant to it. So, Colonel Klepper, how do you develop yourself as a leader, and what are you reading that keeps your mind sharp? So, one of the offshoots of the Army's BCAP program and CCAP program, there's a component of it in which there's some coaching done on the other side. And as I left the Ranger Regiment using the NEO personality assessment and one of the organizational psychologists, you know, like an R2 within the conventional force, an R2 performance specialist, I sat down using my NEO assessment and tried to figure out how to mitigate some of my personal shortcomings, to be honest with you. Anybody who's survived and done well as a field grade may have some pretty sharp edges, edges that don't necessarily translate well into being a functioning organizational leader, a good organizational leader. So I got a lot of utility out of, for lack of a better word, executive level coaching, data-driven executive level coaching outside of military hierarchy. I spent a lot of time exercising. My wife and I spend a lot of time walking, but not only or not necessarily for the fitness component of it, 
but just to have time to think like active reflection time. If you spend time running or time walking or time on an exercise bike or just time alone in reflection and trying to envision what you want to happen, not only in reaction mode to whatever the false urgency of the day is, but trying to actually envision what you want the organization to do, what you want your team to do. I try to read. I'm an avid reader. Like any good brigade combat team, we've got our book club going. Right now, the company commanders and I are simultaneously working our way through Band of Brothers, obviously a pretty readable version of history and grit by Angela Duckworth, trying to take Angela Duckworth's models of how to build mental resilience and view them through a historical lens of what made Easy Company pretty gritty. So, you know, not just reading, but trying to blend those two ideas. I think iGen is a pretty reasonable explanation of how young people think and operate and some of the contemporary cultural pressures on them. I thought Washington's Crossing is really great in terms of just laying out the bare bones of the warfare of nature. I truly believe as soon as we're an army that can't cross a frozen river at night and march 11 miles through the snow, we're in a lot of trouble. To the Sergeant Major's point of trying to maintain balance, there's a book, 1776, that lends a little bit perspective of sort of political and societal turbulence over time. And, you know, a lot of the things that we're feeling and thinking and working through aren't new. You just have to look at the origins of our nation to see it. Obviously, Simon Sinek's written a ton. I got a lot out of primal leadership and the idea of emotional intelligence. But I say all of that with I'm newly and recently skeptical of like the business model books du jour and applying them to military leadership because the thought that I had struggling as a new brigade commander struggling through a CTC rotation was we make decisions under conditions that the authors of business books can't imagine. And right. they're relatively academic models don't always apply to life and death decisions. And so I love those type of transformational books, good to great, and all of those types of things. But we just do something that's a little bit different. I'm not sure those models always apply. Gentlemen, I love your individual professional reading list and what you're doing with some of your brigade leaders. Here's a couple books you may want to consider that I've read recently that I think would not only inspire you, but inspire your company battery troop level commanders and first sergeants. The first one is called Leadership in Turbulent Times by Doris Kearns Goodwin. And she really focuses on President Lincoln, President Teddy Roosevelt, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and President Johnson, and takes them through the arc of their lives to what shaped them before they became President of the United States. And really, it's an amazing book for the officers about the oath of office that we take, and then for all of your leaders about the subordination of the military to our elected civilian leadership. It's incredible, and it goes to your point, Colonel Klepper, of a book that jumps back and forth between you know, a civilian leader, the commander-in-chief, the decisions he has to make during time of war, and then the repression of those decisions. Phenomenal book. And then one of my personal favorites is Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. Every time I read that book, the book doesn't change, but as a reader and as a leader, I change and look at it differently. Well, Colonel Klepper, Commander Klepper, and I'll just tell you, I'm proud of what you all are doing to build and lead a lethal, cohesive, and honorable team of teams across the 173rd Airborne Brigade. And your comments today really, what I pulled out of it was your command emphasis on building a culture of trust and accountability. But likewise, your command emphasis on allowing leaders to include yourselves to try new things, make mistakes, learn and grow, and develop not only in their current position, but what they're going to do for the Army in the years ahead. So I really appreciate your time. You're two incredibly busy and committed leaders. This has been a great podcast. Our guest on the next Leading Great Teams podcast will be Command Sergeant Major Eric Bonapane from the Airborne and Ranger Training Brigade at Fort Benning, Georgia. AUSA will release that podcast on Monday, February 14th. Our listeners can access all of the Leading Great Teams and Army Matters podcasts at www.ausa.org slash podcast. Thank you very much. To all our listeners, thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Army Matters Podcast on iTunes and everywhere podcasts are found. The Army Matters Podcast series is brought to you by the Association of the United States Army, the U.S. Army's professional association, member-supported, Army-connected. Visit us at ausa.org for more information or to become a member. 
Your membership helps AUSA continue to carry out its mission to educate, inform, and connect with the total army, our industry partners, and our supporters of a strong national defense. For questions or to provide topic recommendations, email us at podcast at AUSA.org. Have a great Army Day. Pua.